Good morning and welcome to the third Sunday in Lent. And again, I hope you are having a blessed and holy Lent. Okay, we are going to begin this morning as usual. We are still in the Lenten season, of course. So we're going to begin on page four of our prayer books with those opening sentences. And then jumping from page four to page six, going directly into confession. Uh, number two, if you want to follow along in the book with the... Uh, um, <clears throat> call it Epistle and Gospel. The, uh, those are called their propers. Those are found on page 128. Page 128, where you'll find the call there, the prayer for the day, the Epistle from Ephesians chapter 5, and then the Gospel from Luke 11. And then finally, we are doing this morning Psalm 25. Psalm 25, and that is found on page 369. So 369, for Psalm 25, I'll provide slides for all of these. And what we're doing, again, as usual, or just as a reminder, or if you're new, the uh, lessons here are not the morning prayer lessons, but they are the lessons that are set for the Eucharistic service. And that means that because the sermon that would be preached on Sunday in this church is also the sermon that's going to tie to the lessons here this morning. So we're kind of tailoring it so everyone gets the same sermon and the same uh, collect, epistle, and gospel. So with that... Um, uh, all information and lined up, we are ready to begin. Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, 
and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 25 Unto thee, O Lord, will I lift up my soul. My God, I have put my trust in thee. O let me not be confounded. Neither let mine enemies triumph over me. For all they that hope in thee shall not be ashamed. But such as transgress without a cause shall be put to confusion. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. Lead me forth in thy truth and learn me. For thou art the God of my salvation. In thee hath been my hope all the day long. Call to remembrance, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, which have been ever of old. Or remember not the sins and offenses of my youth, but according to thy mercy think thou upon me, O Lord, for thy goodness. Gracious and righteous is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Them that are meek shall he guide in judgment, and such as are gentle, them shall he learn his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, be merciful unto my sin, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, his seed shall inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is among them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever looking unto the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and in misery. The sorrows of my heart are enlarged, O bring thou me out of my troubles. Look upon my adversity and misery, and forgive me all my sin. Consider my enemies, how many they are, and they bear a tyrannous hate against me. O keep my soul, and deliver me. Let me not be confounded, for I have put my trust in thee. Let perfectness and righteous dealing wait upon me, for my hope hath been in thee. Deliver Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle is written in the fifth chapter of the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, beginning at the first verse. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Therefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Here endeth the epistle. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. 
Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. The Holy Gospel is written in the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the 14th verse. Jesus was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils." He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house, whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In our prayer this morning, we ask God to stretch forth the right hand of his majesty to be our defense against all of our enemies. And this is a necessary petition for the Christian, because for it is thou, Lord, only that makest us dwell in safety, or are from elsewhere from our prayer book. It is only in the knowledge of God that standeth our eternal life. It is trusting in his defense that we need not fear the power of any adversaries. It is then an utter dependence on God, in other words. We are kept both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls. Inside and out, body and soul, the entire, the entire being, the, the entire Christian being relies on the defense of God's right hand of majesty. Now, if we look at what's set down for us to hear and to read this morning in both uh, morning prayer, the uh, proper morning prayer lessons, as well as in the communion service, uh, we see a common thread that's pointing to, the, to, the, to this concept. There's an emphasis on keeping the body and the soul safe. Uh, Jesus, in the gospel, casts out a demon. The demon is keeping this man from speaking. Uh, it's possessing his body for the sake of tormenting him. And then St. Paul, in the epistle lesson this morning, calls us right out of the gate to be imitators of God. Imitators of God. He lists the things that are contrary to Christian life, and behavior, behavior of the body. He reminds us that we are children of light, no longer children of darkness. And to put a a finer point on all of these passages that we have sort of strung together here, uh, Paul writes very clearly as to to why this is important uh, when he says to the Corinthian church, 
he, after, after a discourse, a long discourse on right behavior, uh, speaking especially on sexual behavior, but others as well, he says, do, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, or so, glorify God in your body. So the body says the temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple of the Holy Spirit. The body is in some mysterious way, as we know as Christians, is indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us, each of us who have been redeemed. And God is the one who gave us this Holy Spirit, as the, as the passage says there, to dwell in us. So we have been washed as Christians, we have been sanctified, we've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says, by the Holy Spirit. It is his work. And then we continually now, we must continually consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the gospel lesson this morning gives us another reminder of just what Jesus came to do. In each of his miracles, as we know, we see at least two things. First, he heals the person, straightforward. This is the external, the visible. Jesus in the midst of, in, is in the midst of casting out a demon from a man. It's kept the man from being able to speak clearly for some time. The demon is gone, and then, of course, the man is able to speak. Yet there's also there's an inner dimension to his miracles as well. Uh, there is the power of God on display. As Jesus sees one of his own creatures being inhabited by an evil spirit, his compassion on this. How can this man follow Christ if, he's, if there's this hindrance? How can this man live for God if he is in this kind of bondage? Christ came to redeem mankind, to free him. He came to set the prisoners free, set the captives free, both body and soul. He came to free up the body so that it's able now to, to worship God, to praise God. But there is a hindrance in each of us until he does. There's a, a stumbling block. There's an enemy who seeks to keep us from doing this. This man today if freed, and we know he is freed eventually, if freed, he will have his tongue loose and he will be able to give praise to God, exercise that with his, with his body. That's the work that Christ came to do, among other things. He came to show us the Father, because if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. The writer to the Hebrews says, in chapter 13, he says, uh, through him Christ, through Christ then, he says, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Again, the lips, the body. Now, there are two types of people in this uh, audience, or, or at least two, two, two primarily, we would say. We have those who see the miracle and maybe don't see the greater implication quite at that moment that we're talking about here. But they see the miracle, and what does Luke record? He says, the mute man spoke, the people marveled, but, he, but Luke also says, but some of them said he casts out demons by the power of Satan, the power of the devil, of Beelzebul. This is not uncommon. We know that Jesus had detractors as well as proponents at, at every turn. Uh, even from his birth, someone was trying to kill him. Uh, so not all saw Jesus' power correctly, as we know. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria, an old church father, he says the scribes, and he's referring to this, to this passage today, when they challenge Jesus, he says the scribes and the Pharisees with hearts intoxicated with pride and envy found in the miracle fuel for their illness. They did not praise him, but they even went to the very opposite extreme. So these are those whose minds that he's referring to than we see here in this gospel. These are those whose minds have been blinded by the God of this world, the God of this world who is Satan, who has blinded the minds of unbelievers, keeping them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They see none of this in Jesus. They're in a similar bondage that, that, that this mute demon-possessed man is in, except their bondage was a bondage of sin, of pride, of unbelief, and, and that all equals to spiritual blindness as well. This blindness is captivity. This blindness and this captivity is probably best shown when Jesus gives a sign. He performs a miracle. He drives out this demon from the man in this case this morning. The first thing some of them do is they shout, give us a sign from heaven. 
And you kind of wonder, what do you think this was if it wasn't a sign from heaven? But Jesus always seems to, he always seems to get this treatment. One, one group sees it, one group is totally blind and they don't. But Jesus also, he's, oh, he seems to let the believers alone after this. You know, so he kind of moves on. He does the miracle and they, they're, they, they see the miracle and they're sort of left to kind of ponder uh, the implications, ponder and sort of glory in what's happened. But since the enemies of Christ continue to harass him for demonstrating his power, uh, never mind his compassion for someone, uh, something the Pharisees seem to, to uh, miss, Jesus helps someone and they get upset with him. So he turns and he confronts them. He doesn't just let them wonder. He confronts them. The very self-same Satan who keeps the Pharisees from seeing Christ is, and what, the, what his miracles mean, uh, are the ones who Jesus now has to address. And that's why, hence, today's short parable that Jesus delivers. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and he divides his spoil. So what Jesus means here is that before, before he came into the world, Satan had a much freer reign, it seemed, to wreak havoc on the world. Uh, Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world a few times in the Gospels. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the God of this world, who is Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's very frightening, the power that he has, blinding the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. <clears throat> but now that Christ has come, uh, he has come in human flesh, the very prey that Satan likes to prey on, uh, humanity. Now that Christ has come in human form, he is here to defeat Satan on that very point, on that very level. What man is unable to do in his flesh, Christ is able to do. Christ in human flesh came to win back that status that mankind lost in the Garden of Eden. The strong man in Jesus' parable is Satan. He's fully armed, he says. He guards his palace by his power and his goods, his possessions, the, the, the people that he has control of are, are secure. But Jesus speaks of a stronger man one who comes along and attacks him, attacks the first man. And then this is Christ. This is Christ speaking of himself. He's the stronger man who comes and he attacks Satan and overcomes him. He takes away his armor, which the, he trusted, and he divides the spoil. Jesus Christ has come to defeat the strong man. And he came to overthrow his power. Satan came to the garden, as we, as we recall, back in Genesis, and he enticed Adam and Eve to throw off their desire for God. And since then, he's worked to continue to blind the minds of the vast majority, sadly, of mankind over the centuries, blind them to and keep them in sin. And he's kept them from entering the kingdom of heaven. Uh, J.C. Ryle, an Anglican um, uh, divine a few centuries ago, he says, regarding Christ's teaching, he says, Christ speaks of man's heart as being Satan's palace. He's talking about this parable that Jesus gives. Christ speaks of man's heart as being Satan's palace where he lives. Uh, the natural heart is the favorite abode of the evil one. And all its faculties and powers are, are his servants. And they do his will. He says, he sits upon the throne which God ought to occupy. And he governs the inward man, the devil is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Here again is the inward part that we're referring to. Ryle says it's Satan sitting on the throne of the natural man as the unregenerate heart. But thanks be to God, our hearts as Christians have been opened by the gospel of Christ in new life. And Satan has been dethroned. Yet because of our prayer this morning, we know that the battle isn't over. We still need God to be our defense, both outwardly and inwardly, because Satan has not, of course, as we know, given up. Many testify that this is intensified in their lives during Lent, and hence this lesson for us today, to be on the lookout for those temptations, for his tempting. Though his ultimate end is destruction, 
and he knows it. He seems to want to continue to cause destruction uh, on others as far and as wide and as long as he can. And since this is true and will be uh, true for us until we die, this battle will go on. St. Paul's words this morning are very important for us to hear as well. Because they are the counter. They are the counter to the strong man. They are the counter to the one who would draw us away from Christ if possible. Because Paul begins, be imitators of God as beloved children. Just as a good son, as we know, would imitate his father, especially when he's a good father. Uh, so we are called to imitate God as, as God's children as well. And, and in imitating God, Paul means that because we've been redeemed by God through Christ, we have received what James Boyce calls, quote, the enabling life of God within through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, unquote. The Holy Spirit is quite influential, uh, needless to say, and prominent in today's lessons, if you notice. The Spirit of God, <coughs> the Spirit that God has given us, <coughs> that indwells us, He is the one who directs and sanctifies and governs our bodies and our souls. Boyce goes on there, he says, quote, Consequently, just as physical genes should lead a child in the direction of a parent's chief characteristics, so should a Christian's spiritual genes lead in the direction of the moral character of God, unquote. So primarily what Paul has in mind for us here is the imitation of God in our expression of how we live, in our expression of love, which it boils down to. This passage doesn't stand alone. Of course, it comes on the heels, it's mid-letter. Mid it comes on the heels of what Paul has just said in the section above, if you back up. Paul urges us at the start of chapter 4 to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. In other words, walk or live or behave or act or think in a way that lines up with our Christian profession, avoiding hypocrisy. He urges us to maintain the bond of peace among, our, among ourselves and within the, within the body. We hear over and over uh, from Paul that we are not to walk like the Gentiles do. So, in, in, as modern Christians, we kind of have to continue to translate that quickly in our minds to, to mean that we are not to walk or behave like unbelievers. We've put off the old self, both inward and outward. We are to now renew our minds to align with the mind of Christ. He says we are to speak the truth with one another, since we're members of one another. So it's mutual treatment again. This, the close bond that we have in Christ by his spirit makes us accountable to one another. So after Paul lists these things that we are to, to put away and other things we're supposed to take on as Christians, the section we heard this morning really kind of picks up and continues the theme, this continued uh, treatment. Imitate God as much as lies in you. Walk in love as Christ loves us and has gave himself for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is the main priority of the Christian. And Lent, of course, helps us to um, in, turn greater attention to this as well. But we can't make any progress uh, in body or soul if, we're, if we do not first call upon God to be our defense, as the prayer was per uh, prayer said this morning. We can't make any progress in body or soul if we do not first call upon God to be our defense against all that would hinder us in this effort. And for us to be successful, if we are to be successful, God must be the one to stretch forth the right hand of his majesty, and he must be the one who carries us through. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, 
through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. We beseech thee, Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of thy humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of thy majesty to be our defense against all our enemies, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, Surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace. And that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith and unity of spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are anyways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we thine unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, 
that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom of thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.